great joy to begin our service today. You know, Beethoven, uh, I'm not sure he would roll over in his grave today to hear that arrangement of that. What a great song to begin our service. Our kids' music camp was a huge success this week. These 20 uh, kids right here represent about 90 students or kids that were here throughout the week, and we had uh, culminated with a big concert on Friday night. There were about 85 or 86 kids up here. A lot of those kids go to other churches, or they're just uh, kids from our community. And so these are the ones that were able to make it today. And during the summer, a lot of our parents ask us, when is music camp for next year? Because they plan their vacation around this week. So some of them have left and they've gone to the beach or wherever. Uh, but we're so glad that these 20 or so were able to stay today. Uh, Becky Gallant, would you stand just a minute? She was our camp director this week. There were, there were a, lot of, a lot of workers. Our, our, our core group would, would include Tisha Walker, our choreography, to put the choreography together. Stand up just a minute. <laughs> and Diana, Diana, would you stand with Amanda? She and her daughter Amanda took care of all the drama. And there were about 40 volunteers. So we thank all those that worked with us in putting this together. Uh, that was just one song. I'm going to be quiet and let them sing two more songs. This is called A New Creation. And then the, the last one will be We Will Not Fear. And it'll take us back to uh, the theme song, which is called Back to the Beginning. day looking out for only me, only me. No one to rely on. Everyone had let me down, let me down. Trying to see how perfect I could be, I could be. Suddenly I find I'm face down on the ground, on the ground. 
A refuge and strength in ever present help in trouble, in trouble. As you could see and hear from the words on the screen, the words to these songs, Christy Simpson has done a great job uh, putting these words together and just uh, filling the hearts of these students and these kids with the scripture, with the word of God. And uh, the Lord God Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Do you believe that today? Amen. Kids, thank you. They're going to come out and join their parents as we stand together. All hail the power of Jesus' name. Let's sing. And come Christians, join to sing his wonderful name. Alleluia. Amen. Come Christians, join to sing. 
us, every knee will bow, every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And Philippians uh, just proclaims that, so, uh, rather Philippians 2 verse 9 that says, Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that every knee will bow, every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, the God, the glory to God our Father. Blessed be his wonderful name. Join us and sing. Blessed be your name in the land that is plentiful, where your streams of abundance flow. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name when I'm found in the desert place, though I'm all through the wilderness. Blessed be your name. Every blessing you pour out, turn back to praise. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glory. Morning. morning. It's good to have you here. If you're a guest, it is a privilege that you're here in this place. And Brainerd, before you leave today, look around and make sure you identify someone you don't know and welcome them. And it is good to have you here. Normally, uh, this morning, on Sunday mornings, we our interim pastor, Dr. Jim Shattuck, to be bringing the message. Uh, we'll share a little bit more in just a moment about who our guest speaker is this morning, and you're in for a real treat. Uh, Nate Aiken will be sharing with us through God's Word, so I'll share more about him in just a moment. Just some things uh, happening in our fellowship. You, you saw this morning what uh, was the rem 
remnant of a very busy week for Brian Skinner and his team with Music Camp. We've also had World Changers on campus this week. Lots of things happening here. And thank you, Brian, for bringing those kids in that are representative of this fellowship. Thank you, Mom and Dads, for having them here this week. Also, uh, remember this evening, if you're here, this evening in this very room at 5 p.m., we'll be sharing exclusively with you about the budget for uh, Chattanooga, East Ridge, and North Georgia campuses, the work of our church. That will be a meeting. You remember that we will begin our new budget year starting August 1st, which has been a change. So come here about that. You should have got something in the mail, email in regard to that budget process. But 5 p.m. right in here, we're excited to share the new budget with you and walk with, with our fellowship through that. Also, uh, keep in mind that uh, on the screen you'll see some things that are clicking through our fellowship. ICC training continues. Remember, ICC is a ministry uh, international Community Connection that takes place on Sunday afternoons it is an outreach to refugees, internationals in our community, so be aware of that. They're, they'll be doing some training. We have about four families coming back from overseas here at Brainerd. They'll be part of a panel in that training opportunity. If you're interested in serving, uh, which will begin later on in August, uh, you can plan for that event. Also, on the 27th, we'll be having a men's event. I think there's some competitive cornhole, some good food, some sharing about men's opportunities going forward, and just a time to hang out together on that day on the 24th, so our 27th in that regard. And then you'll also see some opportunities on the screen that will be taking place coming up the end of August with Bible studies or through our discipleship ministries. There's a couple events on Monday mornings and Tuesday mornings for ladies. Our midweek uh, training begins uh, with our students and children's ministries. It kicks off on the 24th of those midweek services. There's a Hebrews class also being taught, and you'll see some other things trickling down the pike on, on that. And so be praying for those. This morning, uh, you will be hearing from a man by the name of Nate Aiken. You may be familiar with his dad, who's been here doing marriage training and conferences with us. And by the way, we're not going to tell on you of the stories he told about you as a child growing up. Nate is an awesome expositor. You will see that and hear that this morning. He will continue our, our teaching out of 1 Peter, and uh, I'm looking forward to hearing him as well. Nate is the discipleship minister at the uh, Open Door Church in Raleigh, North Carolina, and also serves in the uh, Pillar Network as the associational director who helps in, work with revitalizing churches and also deep roots in international missions, theological training as well as church planting. So he comes with uh, a, lot of, a lot of good stuff in his background and he's got an Aiken by his name and we love Dr. Aiken. Uh, he represents our convention very, very well. If you're here to give today, and uh, you can do that as you leave physically. There's some blue boxes at the back. And so and let me pray for us. And then after our mission video, Nate will come up and share with us. Would you pray with me, Lord? Thank you for the morning. Thank you for the worship. Just thank you for these children reminding us what a blessing children are. Thank you for the families they represent and the parents who've made uh, commitments to put those children in a place, Lord, before you. And we pray that you'll honor that parenting. And Lord, we pray today as uh, we hear your word, your truth, that we'll be encouraged and challenged by your word today, Lord. And we thank you for Nate making his way here as Dr. Shaddix is traveling. Keep him and Deborah safe. And we thank you for the morning, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. My name is Reese, um, and choir tour, we went into prisons and we sang, and it was really fun um, just meeting the prisoners and um, singing and sharing the gospel with them. For, so the theme song for this year is Walking Free. I would say the meaning of it um, is if they can't be free physically, they can be free uh, in their soul, but their soul can be free through Jesus. And that's one of the biggest things that we sing through that and show them. This is my first year going, and I decided to go on this trip 
Well, mainly because I thought it'd be fun and a change of pace, and I wasn't really expecting much, but then I found so much more once I was on the trip, and I think I just wanted to do something more, because I normally don't really do anything to share the gospel, and so I thought this would be a good way to try to start doing that. We go to prisons because I think they're really often overlooked, like they're just thought of, well, we don't need to worry about them, or they've done so many bad things, why would we go there? But they're really just people like us. They're, they have names, they have stories. We go there to either plant seeds or we offer encouragement. Um, and it's just really cool to see how many how many lives are changed through that? I don't think that us um, as Americans and even as Christians do enough to minister to prisoners. And Jesus talks about, you know, helping the poor, helping the widows, helping the prisoners. And they need Jesus as much as all the rest of us. So my favorite concert was we went to Angola, and Angola is a huge prison, so we only got to sing like in person to a small number, not a small number, but a small number of the whole population, and then they broadcast it throughout the whole prison, and they also broadcast it to death row, and I remember during our skit that I'm in, it's basically where two girls go to heaven and two girls go to hell, and it's like judgment day, and I remember the part of the skit where we kneel down, we're kneeling down before God, I remember thinking, the people that are on death row right now, this is like their last chance. Like this is what they're gonna face. In maybe a day or a week, they're gonna face God. Like we all are, but they are really soon. So like this is their last chance to hear um, what we're talking about. So that just really stuck out to me. And I'm really glad we got to do that. That was probably my favorite concert. If you've never done this before and you were thinking about maybe doing it or if you just never even thought about doing it, it is a great experience. It's life-changing. It's amazing just to see all their smiles in their prisons and in the rescue missions when they're just happy because you're there. Not only does it touch the prisoners' lives, but it also touches the guards' lives. I believe it touches the students' lives, um, the chaperones. Um, you know, and, and in other ways too, where when you just, uh, when people hear about it, when I came back from work, I had many people at work ask me, how, how'd that choir trip go? How, how did all those prisons go? You know, how'd it, how'd it go? It gave me a chance to spread the gospel to my coworkers. And, and I'm sure that happened with other chaperones, with other students. So it gives us a real boots on the ground way to spread the gospel in ways that otherwise we just wouldn't do. Well, good morning. If you have a copy of God's Word, we're going to be in 1 Peter. So turn there, 1 Peter chapter 4. And while you're turning there, let me just say it is a joy indeed to be here uh, and to open God's Word with God's people. Um, I want to say I'm thankful to Dr. Shaddix for recommending me to step in for him this week. But normally a guest preacher gets to pick the sermon he wants to do. And so Dr. Shaddix decided on the week of kids music camp and a guest preacher to give me a text on suffering. So I'm not quite sure how thankful I am for Dr. Shaddix, though I do, I, I do appreciate his commitment to exposition uh, and to continue to walk through the word. Uh, add to that, it was a nightmare getting here uh, last night. I was supposed to fly to Atlanta, then to here. They diverted us from Atlanta, landed in Birmingham, kept us on the tarmac a few hours. I eventually said, let me off. I'm going to rent a car and drive. I got here a little bit before midnight, and I got about four or five hours sleep. So it appears Satan may not want me preaching this sermon this morning, even though Dr. Shaddix does want me preaching this sermon this morning. Do with that what you will. Uh, but hopefully the Lord indeed will be strong through weakness uh, as we work our way through the text. Years ago, I remember meeting a man named John Lennox. John was talking to us about the problem of evil and the, and the issue of suffering. John was a mathematician at the University of Oxford, very brilliant man, a believer who often debated some of the most well-known atheists in the world. He also happens to be the uncle of, of Kristen Getty from the In Christ Alone fame. And John was telling a group of us who were preparing for ministry at the time that the, the issues of suffering 
and the issue of the problem of evil in our world are the hardest topics he faces as he debates these atheists. And he said it will be the hardest issue you will face as a pastor, but not just as a pastor. It will be the hardest issue that you face as a Christian. Brothers and sisters, we know that's true, not just because of what suffering poses to us philosophically. We know that because of what we have experienced when it comes to suffering. We know what it means to hurt. We know what it means to live in a world of, of cancer and miscarriages. We, we know what it means to suffer. And the text in front of us this morning is all about suffering. And there, there are different kinds of suffering. We're going to see uh, in a fallen world there's the type of suffering that we bring upon ourselves due to our sin. But also there is the kind of suffering that just simply comes to us because we do live in a fallen world. Just as God's grace falls on the just and unjust alike, suffering falls on the just and the unjust alike. And then Peter's also going to highlight a third kind of suffering that he's picked up on in the book, but a third kind of suffering alongside the others, and that is a suffering that comes upon us simply because we belong to Jesus. And here Peter is going to hopefully give us some tools for facing these different kinds of suffering. So I want to read the text. I want to then pray and ask for God's help that it will help us to indeed suffer as people who are committed to the cause of Christ, that we will will suffer as people of the scars for the purposes and cause and glory of Christ. We read the text and then we'll pray and ask for God's help. And our brother Peter tells us he writes this to the elect exiles of the dispersion and he does so under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings, that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. But let none of you suffer as a murderer or a thief or an evildoer or as a meddler. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him Glorify God in that name. For it is time for judgment to begin at the household of God. And if it begins with us, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if the righteous is scarcely saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? Therefore, let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls to a faithful creator while doing good. Let's pray and ask for God's help. Our Father, now as we give our attention to your word, as we turn to the book, I pray and ask that you would help me a sinner, or that you would help me to preach with confidence in your word for the good of your people, confidence in your word for the sake of the lost, but ultimately, Father, for confidence in your word for the glory of your name. Father, this is a difficult topic, and pray that you would prepare our hearts to receive what Peter is saying to the churches this morning. So, Father, now would you show us yourself? Would you then show us our sin? And then would you show us our Savior? Father, now would you please sanctify us in the truth? We know your word is truth. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. What's the first thing you learned about Jesus? Or maybe ask it like this. What is the first thing you remember learning about Jesus? Was it that he walked on water? Or maybe it was that he multiplied bread and fish? Was it that he maybe turned water into wine? If you're a Baptist, you didn't learn that until college. (laughs) But when you really think about it, what is the first thing you learned about Jesus? For me, my earliest recollections are being a child at North Lake Baptist Church in Dallas, Texas, and hearing the song, Jesus Loves Me. And of course, if you know that song, you know that Jesus loves us because the Bible tells us so, but that begs the question, how does the Bible tell us of his love and what is central in that love? I would argue that central in his love for us is the theme of substitution, the the idea that Jesus, the God-man, took man's place in the dock. 
John Stott, in his wonderful work, The Cross of Christ, argues that this theme of substitution is, in fact, the central theme of all the Bible. Here's what he says. The concept of substitution may be said, then, to lie at the heart of both sin and salvation. For the essence of sin is man substituting himself for God. We, we see this in the Garden of Eden, right? Eat this fruit and you will be like God. While the essence of salvation is God substituting himself for for man, we see that at the cross. And I believe as we prepare to hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches through Peter about suffering, it is vital for us to know of Jesus' love and what is central in that love because it is paramount in preparing us to suffer as Christians. My main idea this morning is suffer as a saint and not a sinner. I think the text is telling us that we must suffer as Christians and not because of our sin. And really three, right, uh, three reasons will come out of the text to tell us why to do that. Now here's the context. If you're kind of joining us this Sunday and you've not been working with this church through 1 Peter. Peter is writing this passage on suffering. And he's covered it multiple times in the book. But he is writing this to the churches of the dispersion. Meaning churches spread out all across the Roman Empire. Made up of, of sojourners, of exiles, of strangers in this world. Because that is who Christians are called to be. And Peter writes to the churches, perhaps some believe he writes this shortly before Nero burns Rome and then he blames Christians for it, which intensifies their persecution. And Peter writes them, and by extension, he writes us, future Christians, preparing us for suffering. Because through the out the church, throughout the ages of the church, the duration and the intensity of suffering may be different, but all Christians of every age will face suffering. And in particular, in this passage, Peter is going to give the most space talking about the sort of suffering that comes upon us simply because we are Christians, because we are called by his name. Yet, as Peter writes this, he is one who writes both as an eyewitness and a partaker in the sufferings of Christ. And that is where we pick up the text. And the first reason that we should suffer as a saint and not a sinner is because of this. Suffering, as we will see in verses 12 through 14, suffering reveals who you are. It reveals whose you are. It reveals who is with you. And it reveals where you are headed. Or to say it more succinctly, suffering reveals both our identity and our destiny. Look at verse 12 again. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. Peter begins this new section by addressing the recipients of his letter as beloved or as dear ones. Peter loves these brothers and sisters, and so he begins this new section with a pastoral tone. But he also begins with an immediate exhortation. He begins with an advanced warning. Do not be surprised when fiery trials come. Do not be surprised when suffering comes upon you. Again, Peter is a loving pastor. He is preparing his people so that when they do face suffering, when they do face the fire, they will not fall away. In this, he's like a good pilot. A good pilot warns you that turbulence is coming. A good pilot even warns you, hey, you may not make it to Chattanooga tonight. I have an identical twin brother who has preached here before, and he hates flying, and he hates flying for good reason, I think. On his final flight of his honeymoon trip to Belize, on the final leg, him and Ashley, his wife, were, were put on a prop plane, a single-engine prop plane, and this little four-foot-ten Belizean man was the pilot, and because they had to have the right weight distribution, Ashley was put in the cockpit with the pilot. And as they're taking off, uh, Jonathan told me the weather was just fine, but about five minutes into the flight, he says, in his words, the largest, darkest storm cloud I've ever seen was right in front of us. And he said immediately, rain begins to pelt the windshield, and the, and the, the pilot is kind of fighting with the cockpit, uh, the, the, the joystick like a, like a kid does with a video game. They're fishtailing. He said it's so bad that when they're coming into the runway, they're basically sideways with one of the wings pointing to the ground. And at the last minute, the pilot just kind of knots it in place. They crash down. They, they land, bounce on the runway. And he just looks over to Ashley, the, the pilot, and says, you okay? <laughs> now, a good pilot would have told her, you're going to be okay. We're about to hit turbulence, but we're going to be just fine. And that's what Peter is doing here. Peter, again, is a good pastor. He wants you to know, he wants us to know, trials and suffering are coming, but ultimately you're going to be more okay than you even realize. 
Friends, we will face sufferings. The question that we must wrestle with as we come to this text is, why are we suffering? How are we then suffering? And then what does that suffering reveal about who we are? Peter continues addressing both our identity and our destiny in verse 13. He says this, But rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings, that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. Verse 13, apart from a gospel worldview, is shocking. Peter says, instead of being shocked at suffering, rejoice in it. But only so far as your suffering for living in a fallen world is connected to your allegiance to Christ. This is what he means by sharing in the sufferings of Christ, that you suffer, and we will see in a minute, that you suffer while bearing his name, while, while being a part of working for his sake. And this sort of sharing and suffering has a result attached to it in verse 13. It has a, a result which is future joy, future gladness, when the glory of God is revealed at the second coming. There's this wonderful text in Acts that speaks about the topic of gladness. It says, this scene where Jerusalem, the church of Jerusalem, begins to hear about people coming to faith in Antioch. And they, they send Barnabas, they send the encourager to see what's going on. And I love what it says. It says, when Barnabas got there, it says, when he saw the grace of God, he was glad. Brothers and sisters, Peter is saying, after we suffer for a little while for the sake of Christ, as fellow partakers of his sufferings, sufferings that make it possible for us to see future glory, he is saying, on the final day, when all is revealed, we will see what our suffering has accomplished. We will see it as we walk into new creation. And when we see the grace of God, we will be glad. We should not be surprised that our future glory comes through suffering. For indeed, our destiny is tied up and connected with our Lord himself. What is true of him will be true of his people. And Jesus says in Luke 24, in that scene when he's with these disciples on the road to Emmaus who are despondent because of the cross. They, they don't recognize him. He says, you have little faith. Did you not know that it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and then enter into his glory? And the same is true of Christ's people. On the final day, brothers and sisters, we will be 10,000 more times glad than Barnabas because we will see the grace of God and in it we will rejoice. So he's saying, Rejoice now, knowing what this reveals about the future. Rejoice in suffering as a saint because it tells you something glorious about your future, something glorious about your destiny. Suffering now as a Christian for the sake of Christ is proof of future grace. It is proof of future glory. It is proof of future gladness. But Peter continues, verse 14, if you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed. And these are amazing words because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. Peter gets specific about one of the ways in which we will suffer, and that is simply this idea of being insulted or mocked because we bear the name of Christ, because we bear the name Christian. And it appears from this verse that Peter, ironically, the very same Peter who so often in the earthly ministry of Jesus was sticking his foot in his mouth, it seems as though Peter was paying attention during the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5. Because here's what Matthew 5 says. It looks a lot like this verse here. Here's what Jesus said in that sermon. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. When they insult you because of my name. Verse 12, rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Jesus says, reward, Peter here says, blessings, this contains amazing truth. It is a blessing that comes upon us for suffering for the sake of Christ because it reveals our identity. Suffering insults because you are a Christian is an indicator that indeed the spirit of God, the spirit of glory is upon you. Interestingly, Peter is picking up Isaiah 11, 1 and 2. And Isaiah 11, 1 and 2 is about the Messiah. And now, now Peter takes Isaiah 11, 1 and 2 and applies it to the churches. And that shows us just how powerful this statement is. Isaiah writes this, There shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse. 
and a branch from his root shall bear fruit. And listen to this, and the spirit of the Lord shall rest on him. This is the picture of what happens at his baptism as the Lord is there and God has his spirit descend upon him as a dove. And he says, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And Peter now applies that which was about the Messiah to his people. So that if you suffer, not because of your sin, but you suffer for his sake, you are blessed. It's amazing. Believers, hear what Peter is saying. It is something ironic to the world's way of thinking. Far be it from it being a sign of God's dis displeasure. Suffering for the sake of the name is instead a sign of who you truly are. So loved by God, so identified with God, so connected with him, so connected with his destiny that his very spirit, the same spirit that rested upon his son in whom he is well pleased and the same spirit that raised our Lord Jesus from that grave now lives in us. It's an amazing truth. And this verse seems specifically applicable for our day. This idea of the sort of mocking that comes upon the people of God because they, they will not participate in or normalize the sins of the culture. It's been like this throughout every generation. It's been like this from the beginning. Even the very first temptation in the garden is a mocking at believing God's word. Has God really said to not eat that fruit? In our day, has God really said that about sexuality? Has God really said that about gender? Has God really said that about marriage? Has God really said that about creation and not evolution? Has God really said that about integrity? And on and on and on we could go. In every generation, the word and the ways of God are maligned, and so are his people who take that seriously. We heard that in the song that we just sang. God said it, I believe it. If you are like that, you will be insulted. So Peter is saying, be on guard, be ready, expect this. To the children that sang that song, be ready. At every turn, you will be told by the culture that that should be an embarrassment. Be on guard, be ready, stand firm in the faith, teens in this room, students, but all of us, all believers in this room, hear what Peter is saying. What will be the words of mocking from men will actually be a sign of blessing from God. And Peter was not just a writer of the word in this regard. Peter was a doer as well. Acts chapter 5 records for us. These are amazing verses. The Sanhedrin calls in the apostles. They beat them. They charge them not to speak, listen, in the name of Jesus. And they let them go. And here's what verse 41 says. They left the presence of the council rejoicing because they were counted worthy to suffer dishonor for the name. But secondly, we suffer as saints and not sinners, and he's telling us implicitly here because suffering produces something in us. It produces a refinement. It prunes us. It produces a confidence. You might just say it like this. Suffering produces sanctification. Look at verse 15. But let none of you suffer as a murderer or a thief or an evildoer or as a meddler. Peter now sets the contrast. Whereas the believer should rejoice in suffering, there is a condition. Not all suffering is a cause for rejoicing or a sign of blessing. Notice the, the rejoicing and blessing are only when you suffer truly as a Christian and not because of your own sin. Peter is saying, in a, in a sense, the most simple way we can put it, suffer for the right reasons, don't suffer for the wrong reasons. Now, though Peter will mention some specific sins, I really think this is a blanket statement of Peter just saying, don't suffer for your sins, period, full stop. Because he's going to start with kind of these large, more egregious sins like murder. He's going to work his way down all the way to something smaller like meddling. One scholar speaking of this verse says this, We should not discern from this that believers were actually committing such crimes. Nor is it clear from this that Christians were being taken to court. Blatant sins are listed here for rhetorical reasons so that believers will distinguish between genuine Christian suffering and suffering that is just a consequence of misbehavior. And interestingly, this, this lowest level of misbehavior, it seems, is a word that Peter probably made up. We don't find it anywhere else in the New Testament. We don't find it anywhere else in the Greek, this idea of, of meddling or being a mischief maker. And what he's just simply trying to say, as one pastor put it, is don't get punched in the nose for sticking yours where it doesn't belong. Peter is pointing out why most, while most Christians will never suffer for the most egregious crimes like murder, 
make sure you don't suffer even for just being a busybody. We may even infer, and this is important, I think, in our day as well, make sure we suffer for righteousness, righteousness sake. Don't suffer because we are self-righteous. Now, Peter continues, verse 16. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name. Peter says, far from being ashamed or embarrassed or bogged down by your suffering, rather glorify God in it. And the way he states this is by saying, glorify him in that name, meaning the name Christian, the fact that we bear the name of Christ as Christ followers. He's saying, do this while bearing that name and all that it entails. And notice the irony here. If you know your Bible, how odd is it to hear this from Peter? The very one who was ashamed to be associated with the name of Jesus to the point that even in the face of a little girl, he denied knowing him. This was the one who, while the Lord was being mocked and beaten and humiliated, he was being insulted for his accent and for being with Jesus. We know you are with him for you are a Galilean. And yet he still denied him. And yet now, after the cross and after the resurrection and after the indwelling of the Spirit, he is now bold, encouraging other Christians, be willing to suffer dishonor for the name. And in so doing, when you do that, you share in the very sufferings of Christ and you bring great glory to the one who is worthy of it all. Brothers and sisters, this is very much an encouragement against apostasy, the idea of falling away from the faith because of suffering, because of trials. Peter is now saying, in a sense, do not drop the name because of potential shame. He's saying, press on. He's given us reasons to press on. He's again saying, know what this reveals about you. Know what this will reveal on the future day. It will reveal future glory. When all things are made right, you will be vindicated for suffering in this life for the sake of his name. In fact, Paul will tell the church at Rome, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. Even though the things done against us are shameful, we are not to be shamed. We have a confidence in the fact that God will vindicate us. And Peter now gets to the heart of what is meant by suffering that produces sanctification. Verse 17, listen to this. For it is time for judgment to begin at the household of God. And if it begins with us, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if the righteous is scarcely saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? There's a lot going on here. I'll try to just break it down really quickly. Peter here is picking up an Old Testament reference in Ezekiel. Peter is saying that God, and this, this is consistent with the Old Testament, this is consistent with the sweep of redemptive history, God always begins judgment against sin with the people of God. This, this suffering and this judgment is connected back to verse 15. It is a suffering and a judgment that comes upon us because of our sin. And yet, the judgment that comes upon us because of our sin is a, is a pruning rather than punitive judgment. It is a refining, restorative judgment. But that is not so for the unrighteous. That is not so for those who are not part of the people of God. Peter is saying that here. He said, if judgment comes for the people of God, how much worse will it be for those, those who are not his, which includes those who would apostatize or fall away? Because notice how he puts it. He says, how much worse will it be for those who do not obey the gospel of God? Hebrews 10 picks up on things like this when it comes to apostasy. How much worse will it be for those who have trampled underfoot the Son of God? And who have profaned the blood of the covenant. Again, Peter is a loving pastor trying to help us stick with it. But he's also loving in allowing unbelievers to see this word as well. God has made a way for you to be right with him through the blood of his son. To reject that, you will then be called one who is ungodly and a sinner. And in judgment, you will be swept away. But brothers and sisters, I think there's an application here for us first. Particularly, I think, in our day of social media. And I think it's simply this. Our first instinct when it comes to sin and when it comes to unrighteousness should not be to look at the world. It should be to look at ourselves. It should be 
to do business in our own hearts, to do business in our own people, among our own people, to leave judgment of the world up to God. This doesn't mean that we don't lament the sins of the culture. We certainly do. But we should be quicker to identify our own sins rather than to rail against the world's. He says here, judgment is to begin with the household of God. God will deal with the wicked. God will deal with those who mock us. And he says here, if the righteous are scarcely saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? Now, Peter is not implying that God is reluctant to save. He will say as much in his second letter. He'll say that God is desirous of all to come to a knowledge of the truth. No, instead, verse 18 seems to carry the idea of the narrow way of salvation. Indeed, it's exactly what Jesus was talking about, this narrow way, which is a way that will include suffering and hardship. We're saved through that. In fact, the New Testament is very clear about this. Our perseverance in the midst of those things is a sign that we are saved. Again, Paul will say this in Acts on his first missionary journey. It is through many tribulations we must enter into the kingdom of God. If that was true of Jesus, why will it not be true of us? But realize that persevering and suffering, by being refined now, we will escape the judgment to come. We will escape the judgment of those who reject God and reject his son. Hebrews talks about this. This is a loving kindness of God towards the children that he loves, that he disciplines them. It is his purifying presence among us. He is, he is sanding off in us things that need to be gone, and he is using suffering and the consequences of our sin to do that. He is a loving father who even uses the consequences of our sin for our own shaping. Again, suffering is producing something in us. Consider then what is being said here. God judges you for sin in this life because he is making you now what you will be on that day. He judges us now, so he will not judge us then. But think about this truth in light of his either pruning judgment if you're a Christian or his punitive judgment if you're an unbeliever. If you're a Christian... The judgment you face in this life for your sins is as close to hell as you're ever going to get. But the flip side is true. If you are an unbeliever, the blessings in this life are as close to heaven as you're ever going to get. So I just want to make an appeal to you if you're here and you don't know him. God has made a way for you to be in right relationship with him through the sacrifice and blood of his son. All you have to do to take hold of that is admit that you are a sinner, confess faith in him, turn to him, trust him, him alone, his work on the cross, and believe in his resurrection. And we are told if you do that, you will be saved. If that's you, there will be pastors here at the end of the service. Please come find them and ask them what does it look like to put faith and trust in Christ and in Christ alone. Because if you do, as opposed to what is said here about the ungodly, you will find a righteousness that is not your own. And believers, let's see his loving, sanctifying, purifying judgment now as a call for us to break from our sin. Which leads finally to the final point. Why we should suffer as a sinner and, and suffer as a saint and not a sinner is because we have deep resources for suffering. In fact, we can say it here. We can entrust our suffering over to God. Verse 19 is an amazing verse. Therefore, let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls to a faithful creator while doing good. Peter says, now in light of all that has been said, he says, therefore, in light of these gospel truths of our identity and our destiny, in light of the narrow way of salvation and the judgment of the ungodly, in light of the fact of all this that I have said, let us entrust ourselves to God. Let us entrust ourselves over to him. It is a beautiful sentiment as Peter is saying, in the midst of the fire, entrust what is most precious about you, that being your soul, entrust that over to him. I have a little girl who's two years old whose name's Ada, and she is precious. Precious. 
And she's doing this new thing where if she wants me to pick her up and hold her, she walks over to me and she says, Daddy, hold you? And I'm always like, yeah, babe, I think we can work that out. Peter is telling us, in the midst of our suffering, we can go to our Father and say, hold me. And indeed, he will. He gives us reasons because he's, he's all-powerful and he keeps his promises. He's all-powerful in that he's creator. Listen to this. He has created and upholds all things simply by the word of his power. And he is faithful, ever faithful. He keeps all of his promises. He's not like, I have three brothers. He's not like my brothers were when they would tell me promises when they were kids. They would put their, you know, cross their fingers behind their back. I never did that. <laughs> I had to keep my fingers crossed when I said that. <laughs> no, Paul will tell his young protege, Timothy, and I love this verse. He says, even when you are faithless, he is faithful. And he tells us one of the ways we demonstrate that we have entrusted ourselves to him even in our suffering is that we continue to be zealous for good works. We do not let suffering paralyze us. We do not let it keep us from being faithful. We do not let it make us resent him. And brothers and sisters, as we wrestle with these things, and these are weighty things, we should remember who it is that wrote these words. Because indeed, Peter will walk the martyr's path. And he will do so in trusting himself to a faithful creator. It is reported by one of the early church fathers that Peter would endure a passion like our Lord. In fact, church tradition tells us that he was crucified upside down because he did not count himself worthy to be crucified like his Lord. Indeed, I said it a minute ago, Peter is a good and faithful pastor. He does not ask anything of his people that he is not willing to endure. So quickly, in light of that, I want four quick applications on suffering with some apologetic considerations. The first one is this, we will suffer. Suffering comes to us all, as I said at the beginning, some of our suffering is a result of our sins, some of our suffering is just a result of living in a fallen world. We will not always be able to trace why we are suffering, but we do know this from this text and other ones, that all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will face persecution. You might say it like this, all Christians will join Christ on the Calvary Road. But we should be amazed at grace this morning because the gospel is telling us very clearly that Jesus of Nazareth solves both kinds of suffering. Number two, we must suffer for the right reasons. This text is an exhortation to suffer because of righteousness sake, not because of your sin or your folly. Number three, we can trust the promises of God. Three jump out from this text. These are certainly not exhaustive. The first one is simply this. He is in control. Again, he is creator who is absolutely sovereign over the affairs of men. He is not caught off guard by our suffering. Number two, he is good. God is light and in him is no darkness at all. Even when we cannot see it, even when we cannot trace what is happening, Paul reminds us that he is working for our good. Those who are called according to our purpose, he is working all things towards our ultimate good. A few months back after our most <clears throat> recent miscarriage, we had a pastor's wife who shared with us a little children's book that illustrates beautifully this point. The name of the book is The Moon is Always Round. And it's meant to explain, it's a children's book meant to explain to a little boy or girl why their brother or sister didn't come home. And it's a dad telling his son, when they look at the night sky and it doesn't look like the moon's always round, you know, tonight it looks like a fingernail, he's saying, but son, the moon is always round. Tonight it's a half moon, you can't see it. Son, the moon is always round. It's a good reminder. Even when we cannot see it, God is always good. We can trust the promises of God, which leads to the final promise, suffering is not wasted. 
Suffering is producing something in us. Yes, again, much of our suffering, we may not always be able to pinpoint what it is doing, but we will understand on that final day when all is brought into the tribunal of God that Paul tells us very clearly in to the church at Corinth that even our suffering now is not wasted because for us it is preparing an eternal weight of glory. Eighty years of suffering in this life will seem as nothing compared to the glory that will be revealed to us. Apologetically, I wanted to say a couple things. One, we may not be able to answer fully all the questions about pain and suffering and evil, but I think we have enough to begin to answer the questions. First, we trust that we have an all-powerful good God who is at work allowing these things, even when we don't fully understand why. One pastor in New York says this, if you have a God great and transcendent enough to be mad at because he hasn't stopped evil and suffering, then you at the same time have a God great and transcendent enough to have good reasons for allowing it even when you don't see it. But second, I just want to say this. In the purposes of God, God has allowed a world in which human beings are responsible moral agents. Thus we can disobey and bring sin in, which also means we can bring suffering in. Because in the end, that means human beings will have a far greater understanding of who he is, what he is like, what his character is. Because we have gone through a fallen world, we will on the last day be able to better understand fully what is justice, what is forgiveness, what is redemption, what is love. If God had made us automatons with no free choice, we would never understand true love. The sort of love that has come down to sacrifice for us. Which leads to the final application. Let's remember this morning that we have deep resources for our suffering. You know, the questions are often asked, in the midst of suffering, does God love us? And is God going to do anything about suffering? And the answer, brothers and sisters, even the answer, unbelievers, is yes, look at the cross. I mentioned John Lennox at the beginning, and I never forgot the story he shared when talking about suffering. He talked about how years ago he was in a communist country and he was in a synagogue and he met this brilliant young Jewish girl who was from South America. She, did, she didn't understand Yiddish, and so he was looking at all the feast of the, the Jewish feast on the wall, the Old Testament feast, and he was beginning to explain to them. He was translating from the Yiddish into the Spanish, and he said he was taking translator's license and he was beginning to tell her how those all pointed to Jesus. And he said as he was working his way around the room, he wasn't prepared for what would be in the middle. Because he said in the middle was a door and over it was the gates of Auschwitz. And he said as you walked into the room, there were pictures of the experiments that Dr. Mangley did on children. And here's what he said. He said, when I got to this, these pictures, the young woman put out her arms and said, what does your religion say about that? And Lennox said to her, I will not insult the memory of your family who perished in the gas chambers by offering you a simplistic answer. He said, because I haven't got one. And he turned back to us and he said, this is the hardest problem I face as a Christian. Atheists don't have the problem. They say there is no God and that's their solution. They solve the intellectual problem and yet the suffering remains. So I said to this young woman, I want to say something to you that you're going to find hard. You know that I believe that Jesus is the Messiah. And she said, yes, I know you believe that. I said, you find that difficult, and I understand that, but just try to think for a moment. Suppose he was the Messiah. Suppose he was the Son of God. Then I just want to ask you one question. What's he doing on that cross? He said, that shows me that God does not remain distant from the problem of suffering and evil, but has become part of it. And he said, as I said that to her, tears began to gush down her face, and she said, why has no one ever told me that? He continued with us. He said this, Christian, in the end, the hardest problem you're going to face 
is the theodicy problem, the problem of God and suffering. There is only one answer on the market that begins to make sense of it all, and it is not the pitiless universe of the atheist, nor is it Darwin's survival of the fittest. No, it is the one who hung upon the cross, who loved me and gave himself for me. Brothers and sisters, we do indeed live in a broken and fallen world. Peter's exhortation to us is to press on because just as it was with our Lord, there is great glory at the end of the Calvary Road. God has demonstrated his absolute love for us in a bloody cross, and he has demonstrated his absolute power in a vacated tomb. The irony of the cross is that Jesus, the only perfect, innocent, sinless one, suffered in the place of the murderers alongside of thieves. He suffered, suffered in the place of meddlers and, ev meddlers and evildoers like us. R.G. Lee, the great preacher from years ago at Bellevue said this, that at the cross, Jesus became for us all that God must judge so that we by faith in him might become all that God cannot. Which is why I love this poem from Ed Edward Chilito, who was an English minister. He wrote this poem after the suffering he witnessed in World War I. We'll move to close with this. It's a poem entitled, Jesus of the Scars. It says this, we must have thee, O Jesus of the Scars. Our wounds are hurting us. Where is the balm? Lord Jesus, by thy scars, we claim thy grace. We know today what wounds are. Have no fear. Show us thy scars. We know the countersign. The other gods were strong, but thou was weak. They rode, but you stumbled to a throne. But to our wounds, only God's wounds can speak. And what God has wounds, but thou alone. Hear me this morning, believers, in preparation of suffering. The sufferings of Christ, even our own present sufferings, are telling us who we are. They're telling us whose we are. They're telling us where we're headed, a place where there will be not even any more pain or tears. Knowing that now prepares us for the Calvary road ahead. We can entrust our suffering to him because after all, what sort of God has scars but thou alone? And you see, it's true what I learned even as a little boy at North Lake Baptist Church. Jesus loves me. This I know. Peter's saying even our suffering tells us so. Let's pray, and then we're going to move to a time of celebrating what the Lord Jesus has done on our behalf in the cross and resurrection through the Lord's Supper. Father, your word is very clear. Your word is able to make us wise unto salvation through faith in the Lord Jesus. And so, Father, I pray for those in this room that may not be believers. Father, I pray that this day would be the day when they are made wise unto salvation. And, then, Father, I do pray for believers. You tell us in that same passage that your word trains and instructs us in righteousness. Certainly part of that has to be preparation for suffering. Father, I pray for these brothers and sisters in this room that you will have them ready. Help them to know the king will not forget them. So, Father, now I'm done. But I pray that you'll keep working among us. And we know we can entrust that to you for Jesus' sake. And we pray this in his name. Amen.